would have uh, heard him if you watched the game on Saturday. And we know you watched the game on Saturday. So you heard Terrence Oglesby working with our guy West Durham on Saturday. T.O., what's up, my man? So Thanks so much for hopping on today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with Wester. That was my first game with him. I've known Wes since I played, so I'm not sure if that says a lot about me or a lot about him. So, uh, no, it was uh, no, it was a it was a good game. I thought it was a good showing. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, is Louisville has talent. So they're going to be able to keep up with some teams. It's just, man, that some of the mistakes they make are mind-blowing. But uh, fortunate for Red and everybody in an orange uniform, I, you know, they get out with a win, and uh, they have an opportunity here coming up. Uh, yeah, and uh, you saw him, and it, it felt like a very Syracuse game of what we've watched over the last month here, T.O., on uh, Saturday of, man, they had some moments looking great and built that 19-point lead in the second half, and then all of a sudden it's a bit white-knuckled down, down the stretch. What, what, do you, what do you make of what you saw out of the Syracuse squad? Uh, they're very talented. Uh, they're very thin. Uh, you know, Malik Brown, he's a guy to me that doesn't get enough credit. Uh, what he does inside the paint, yeah, I think he's a little, you know, he's really skinny, but he's strong enough to hold ground. He rebounds well. He does all those other things that uh, you, you need for winning basketball. He does a terrific job with those things. But uh, to me, there's they're, they're probably a player or two away from being really good. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with Benny Williams not being a part anymore. Uh, it has to do with some injuries that have gone up and down that road roster it, it feels like they're a player or two from being like top 15 top 20 that's where it feel, that's what it feels like because you have that elite talent with Judah uh, Judah Mintz and I'll be honest I think Chris Bell is turning into a second elite talent some of the shots he made uh, and the, the ways that he was able to create off the dribble he covers a lot of ground when he's coming off screens uh, it, it, I was thoroughly impressed with him but I think all in all a player away but very dangerous come tournament time uh, I say you, you saw Chris get seven rebounds which kind of blew all of our minds a little bit because that is not his normal uh, normal operation on the court but it, it was good to see uh, you know we, we, we've been complaining about the net metric here for for a long time uh, T.O. but I test to you what what Syracuse showed you on Saturday you know is it a tournament team is it not or, or are they just in the pile of you know 60 teams right now that think they're tournament teams but only maybe 20 of them are going to end up uh, in the tournament this year uh, you know they're considered right now, and I think 20 wins since the first time since I can't remember four or five years ago, yeah, right? Yeah, five, five years ago. And and here's the thing, like I think Red's done a great job knowing that now they're thin and they're still getting wins four in a row now. If they're able to beat Clemson at Clemson on PJ Hall Senior Night, one I would be surprised. Uh, two, that would be massive uh, just for their tournament implications. If they're able to do that and win a game in the tournament. It would only bode well for them. I, as far as the eye test is concerned, though, the link to shooting, uh, Chris Bell stepping up. I feel like J.J. Starling is just a rim attack guy who's just now you know, kind of feeling what he is and what he isn't allowed to do. Uh, I think he's more of a lead guard than anything else. The, pro- the problem is, is Judah Mintz is at his best whenever he's attacking off the bounce. So it's kind of a weird dynamic. But they have two rim attack guards. They have an elite shooter in Chris Bell. Malik Brown is, is a pleasant surprise on the defensive end. The, the interesting one to me is uh, Justin Taylor because he's shooting you know, 30% from three on the year, but last year he shot 39%. And it's like, where did things not click? Because his shot's not broken. It's a little bit high and a little bit behind his head, but it's not broken. If he was, if he had the same year as uh, this year as he did last year, I feel like you probably have you're probably 22 and eight as opposed to 20 and 10. Uh, not trying to put it all on him, but I think he just adds another element to this offense. And I just. I have a lot of respect for the talent that they have. It's past that first five is where you get nervous. And yeah, obviously, uh, Quidier Copeland is the main guy off the bench. You, you did not get the full cue. You sort of didn't. You sort of didn't. To you, you got the cue highlight package, but he fouled out in eleven minutes, so you didn't get his whole thing. But I mean, that dunk he had, <laughs> and I don't even know how to describe the double reverse, whatever the heck that was, uh, layup. He, he's certainly adding uh, as much excitement as anybody in the league right now. Yeah, I, I call him the microphone because as soon as he walked in, he's carrying a speaker into the Yum Center for shoot around. <laughs> and th- there were no basketballs out on the court whenever they got there. And I'm not sure whose responsibility that is. It sounds like that's a manager's responsibility for Louisville that he's put some balls up. They didn't have them. Uh, so th- they let stood there with a speaker and. Quadir is 
is going nuts on the baseline, the loudest person in the gym by a long shot. So I call him the microphone from here on out. I, I thought he was uh, tremendously entertaining to watch. Uh, he, he really is, you know, out of that top six on that roster, he's really the only pass first guy. Uh, if you think about it, because Judah's not a pass first guy. He ends up with assists, sure, but he's not a pass first guy. J.J. Starling, more of a rim attack guy, likes to get inside of eight feet, not a pass first guy. Uh, Quinnier is, and, and he's been able to carve out a niche by a couple of things, knowing where to get the ball and uh, providing some of these extra effort hustle plays that you saw at the end of the game against North Carolina. Uh, I, I'm a fan. I think he's really good. I think he's long. He's athletic, and his game's going to continue to develop. And if you do lose Judah Mintz after this season, uh, you're going to bring more of a pass first guy. I would imagine he steps into that one spot, and then you know you can put JJ off the ball and have him attack. But uh, he's a lot of fun to watch. I really enjoyed it, and how athletic were those two plays? It was really amazing to watch. Uh, I mean, the dunk, losing his shoe, and then fouling somebody about ten seconds later was it was a, it was a definitely a a quadir 30 seconds of the game that we, we see stuff like that all season long he's the yeah. only thing that wouldn't have been but the only thing that would have been better is if he blocked the shot with his shoe yeah that, like coming back down and he almost did and then the like ref, it, it, yeah it was awesome yeah i'd say then the refs could have figured out if that was legal or not which which probably would have taken like a, a 10 minute review just uh, just for fun uh but uh terrence oglesby is uh with us he uh was with our, our guy west durham on the call uh, on saturday and uh, you watch this league, uh, Tia. What, what do you make of the ACC this year? Obviously, the the metrics tell us a, a story that that the league is not what you know we we've all been used to for a long time. Uh, do you buy into that? Is that telling the right tale, the wrong tale? What what is the ACC to you this year? To me, if it's an eye test only, it's a six team league. I would throw Pitt in there, and I think Syracuse is right there at it. Uh, six, seven team league. If it was up to me, it would be seven teams because it would be North Carolina, Duke, Virginia, uh, Wake Forest, Clemson, and then Pitt. And then I would throw Syracuse being that last team. Man, there's just nothing really in the non-conference. I, there is a little bit. I mean, who did they beat? They beat uh, Oregon, which, had, which has turned out not to be terrible. I think Oregon struggling at points during – uh, the Pac-12, like, that hurts them a little bit. But to be honest with you, like, it's not that bad of a record. And uh, this net metric, and I feel like I've ranted and ranted and ranted about, you know, the scheduling and what makes for a good net, it doesn't make sense. Uh, their quad wins and losses al- align directly with Pitts, and Pitt is 40 spots higher in the net. I can't figure it out. I, I don't understand what – what this is, and it, it, not only do you have to schedule correctly, but you have to beat teams that you're favored by 15, by 30, and then you have to beat teams that you're favored by 20, by 50. And and well, first things first, like people say, well, the net uh, it caps, you know, 20 point wins. Well, that's all well and good. The problem that you run into is it doesn't discount the offensive and defensive metrics that are factored into the net score. So what ends up happening is, sure, they cap the win at 20 points, but if you hold a team for one of 27 from shooting, that applies into your net metrics and your predictive metrics. I don't understand why that's a thing. Why can't it just be the best teams going in? Why even have this net? We wouldn't be paying attention to it if the NCAA didn't back it. Uh, it's it's a ridiculous metric, and I can't believe there we we have it. I, I would assume this is doesn't last for too much longer. Yeah, it, it is certainly not giving us a number of what it was claimed it was going to do. You know, five six years ago, which was hey, we're going to put emphasis on big wins. Oh, that's nice, but it's accidentally. I don't know if it's accidentally or whatever happened, but it's uh, it's accidentally putting emphasis on blowing out crap teams in November, which uh, is not what anybody wants, right? To I mean, you go back, they're like, hey, let's let's get more of these great non conference games. This is telling you to do the the exact opposite of those things when you put your schedule together. Yeah, it, I've been on this train for a long time. I'm almost exhausted. But it's like, you know, the Big 12, you look at a couple of their teams, like TCU's projected in. Well, their non-conference strength of schedule was, what, 356? There's only 360-something odd teams. You can't do that. But yet here we are, uh, here we are projecting them in the field in 32 and Kim Palm and whatever they are in the net. It's it's absurd. So if if that ends up being the case, the people who are going to suffer are the college basketball lifers that go in and watch November and December games because people are going to start taking advantage. You're going to have one, maybe two uh, big conference schedule, big conference game scheduled. The rest of them are going to be a whole bunch of 357, 362 ranked teams. 
and and you just have to beat the brakes off of them. And the feel good story of putting a walk on in at the end of the game, oh. they're over, they're done. It reminds me a little bit of when Miami was in the Big East and they were beating the brakes off of everybody, and the BCS took into account the fact that they were beating everybody really bad. So they put them in the national championship game, and then some games they would win, some games they would lose. But it was like, it, 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 why are we counting these games against Mississippi Valley State, uh, Utah Rio Grande, or Texas Rio Grande Valley, Nebraska Omaha? Like, it, it doesn't make sense. And the only people that suffer are one, the TV people, and two, the fans that really watch during those months. Yeah, I mean, I think back to, you know, Syracuse was in uh, the Maui event this year, which was the, like the most stacked tournament that's ever uh, existed. Like those things just, it won't happen anymore if this is to be the case uh, going forward, which would be uh, unfortunate for sure. We got uh, our guy Terrence Oglesby with us, and, you know, we're talking ACC, but I, I know you, you cover the whole country here, uh, T.O. It, it, we're, we're in March now, so we're in zone of the tournament. We're in zone of figuring this stuff out. Uh, who pops to you? Who Who is your team right now if you had to pick one or pick a couple uh, to go the whole way uh you know what i would i'm probably going to be hated up there in syracuse for saying this but uconn's about as physically dominant as you've seen uh, uh, from a team i mean they've been awesome all season long they've got big guards they can't be sped up they've got donna mcclean who's one of the most uh gifted five men protecting the rim in the country uh uconn pops out houston's been hit by the injury bug a little bit uh, Purdue, obviously, with Zach Eady. But the, the team that really sticks out to me, who I think could win the whole thing, uh, Tennessee. Uh, Rick Barnes, what he has. They went to the what the Sweet 16 last year, got beat by Florida Atlantic, who was hitting their stride at the right time. They brought back everybody except for Euros Plavsic, so you don't have those two flagrant fouls again. You don't have to worry <laughs> about those. And then, not only that, uh, they brought back everybody, and they added two scores, one in jo- Jordan Ganey, who's been up and down. But Dalton Connect has been as good as advertised. I mean, even better at points. And whenever you add the best on-ball scorer uh, in the country, and I think he is that. He's listed at 6'6", 215. I think he's taller. I think he's 6'7", six, 6'8", six, ish. And he can just score off the bounce. They run the Kevin Durant offense for him. Give it to him and get out of the way. I mean, it's one of those things. It's it's a marvel to watch. He can go off and score 20 on his own, and their defense didn't go anywhere. Their defense went from, I think, uh, second in the country to third in the country. Real drop-off. So, I like, it's this Tennessee team. Now they have offensive firepower, and uh, I think they're just going to continue uh, to run through. I think they're going to win the SEC, and I think they make the Final Four. Yeah, it's uh, crazy to look what Connect has uh, done. The, who was it, Auburn a couple weeks ago? He he, he just lit no, up down the, the, the stretch. It was just, he won't stop scoring. Uh, what's wild, I look at it, T.O., is you, all these teams you list is like, oh, Purdue, they're always snake pick in the tournament. Tennessee, Rick Barnes can't win uh, the big one. UConn, they'd have to go back-to-back. Nobody ever goes back-to-back. Houston, they've never gotten it done. It feels like all the top teams this year have like that that one like looming thing over them that you that makes everyone yeah. hesitate at this point of the year. That's right, and then you have you know the Dukes of the world, North Carolina. Everybody's just kind of lurking around. Auburn's good again. Who's been to the national championship game? Oh, however many years ago, like uh, I, I think it's going to be a really good uh, March Madness. I do worry about the seeding, uh, just because of how poor this met these metrics have been. That that's my biggest concern is how the seeding's going to work. I don't think. Because of the net, we're going to end up with the four best teams in the Final Four. Uh, yeah, uh, they, you could get accidentally all clumped together. Uh, last thing for you, T.O., we're, what are we sitting? We're 13 days out from uh, Selection Sunday right now. Now till then, what, what's the biggest thing you're keeping your eye on? I think it, it has to be bid stealers, especially for bubble teams. That's the thing that scares me a lot. Uh, you know, conferences like the Southern Conference, can Bucky McMillan really – uh, keep things going and, and not have any surprises at that level. That's the thing that scares me. Is High Point going to be able to run through the Big South? Uh, they won the regular season, but UNC Asheville won it last year with a guy named Drew Pember, who's one of the best players in mid-major basketball. But who are the, you know, not that kind of bit stealer, but some of the other ones around the A-10, um, you know, where you could get an at large with one or two with one or two teams and have a third or a second at large. That's what scares me the most, uh, being an ACC guy. But uh, by and large, I, I think I'm excited just about the whole thing. I'm going out to the Mountain West tournament. The conference called me. I'll be doing theirs. Uh, that's going to be a great uh, tournament in and of itself. Six teams are projected to be in the league or be in the NCAA tournament, and it's a fun league with a bunch of teams that can win a game or two. So I'm excited to get out there. That's probably what I'm looking forward to most. 
But uh, by and large, I mean, it, it, there's just so much good right now. Can Josh Schertz uh, go from Division Two, where I coached against him at the Division Two level mm. at LMU? He goes to Indiana State. He's there for a few years. Now they're probably going to the NCAA tournament. Uh, it, it's been a, an incredibly fun year. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I haven't had a time to blink because there's been so much going on on my end. But uh, it's been fun, it's been busy, and there's a lot of really good basketball. Uh, yeah, for those that don't know, uh, Terrence is also doing a bunch of stuff with the Hornets. So uh, the, the fact that you had five minutes today is uh, amazing with what you, everything you got going on uh, right now. But uh, uh, always great to talk ball with you, Terrence. So we've arrived at the most fun month of the year. We will be rooting against your alma mater tomorrow, but uh, thanks so much for hopping on. Hey, understood. And as busy as I've been, I'm sorry I haven't been able to come on here more. But it's uh, I've ended up, I'm going to end up tallying 70 games by the time the season is over in person. Oh man, good stuff, Terrence. So, so it's going to be a lot. But I have, but I appreciate you guys having me on. And Brian, thanks for the, for your patience. Oh, absolutely, Tio. Always great to chat, my friend. Thanks for hopping on. All right, thank you. All right, there he goes, Terrence Oglesby of the uh, of the Everything Network. That, the, the dude is everywhere, man. Did a great job on the game. He and Wes were. Uh, Excellent uh, watch and listen on uh, Saturday, uh, for sure. All right, let's hit a break. Phone lines open when we come back. At this hour, brought to you by William Attar. Heard in a car, call William Attar. Our phone number, 315-437-7644. For ESPN 44, we'll hit the phones when we come back after this. It's Q Sports Talk and ESPN Radio.